Good morning. For those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Pastor Michael. I've been on staff here a while. Um, <laughs> so I was a teacher before that, and I just, I love serving God's people. I, I love the fact that he is the king, and he is so good, and that he shows us what he wants from us. And it is important that we tell the stories of what God has done in our lives as individuals and as the, in the lives of our church. And the album that's coming out, God Can, is all about that. It's about setting up those remembrances, setting up those memorials so that we can look back and see what God has done and give him glory for that. I've been a part of spiritual battles. I've been a part of it personally. I've seen it in the lives of individuals. I've been aware of the big spiritual battles that are going on in the country and, and around the world, but those are so big, it's, it's hard almost to get my arms around them and, and really grasp it. I've seen spiritual battles on, in families as they fight for their children, they fight for their marriages. Take the Land is about the biggest spiritual battle I've ever personally been a part of. It's about the story of us coming here and the vision that God gave our pastor confirmed it through our leadership and brought it to our church and the fight and the struggle to get here. And I want to share that story with you and what we can learn from it this morning. Now, as we get started, I, I want to warn you a little bit. Um, I'm an excitable guy, and <laughs> that's my wife laughing. Love you, dear. Um, one of the things that she and I will talk about is when I'm up here uh, preaching, I got to pull back a little bit because I get a little excited. It can be hard to understand me. I go too fast. And so I make sure that I'm in my good teacher mode. Well, I'm probably going to start preaching a little bit more this morning because I'll tell you, I don't normally get this excited when I'm prepping. I don't normally cry when I'm looking back at what God has done. And I got to tell you, it was an emotional week, just rejoicing and seeing the amazing things my God has done through Encounter. And so you keep giving that back. You, you, as often as it comes, you throw it right back at me and we'll, we'll just see what the Lord does. So take the land starts with the idea of the army of God. You know, it, it, some of the ideas are from that old hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers, Marching as to War. And the song starts off, church arise because the king has given an order. What has God given to you? What has he ordered you? In your life. This idea of the Christian soldier is throughout Scripture. In 2 Timothy 2, uh, Paul is trying to encourage Timothy and he tells them, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Being a Christian is going to be hard. There are going to be struggles. The book of Philippians is, is just mind-blowing. I had a, a professor show me several years ago that Philippi was a Roman colony. And what that means is it was settled by individuals that served in the Roman army. They either had to fight through 16 wars, not battles, but 16 wars, or fulfill 25 years of service, at which point they were granted Roman citizenship and they were given land and they were full-fledged members of the Roman Empire, things that they could pass on to their children. And so Paul fills the book of Philippians with military imagery. In Philippians 1, 12, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And he's using this language of that battle line advancing against the enemy, the gospel advancing against our enemy that is the darkness of this world. One of the things that these soldiers knew is that winning does not always mean living. They would win a battle for the Roman army and they lost their best friend. And, and to realize that even in great victory, there can be loss. But I gotta tell you, one of the great beauties of the Christian faith is that for us, winning is dying. We are assured of victory because he tells us in 121 that for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The loss will be overcome. The loss will be a joy. He tells us in Philippians 2 to do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. That idea of the army being surrounded on all sides and having to battle. And he tells them that 
among whom you shine as a light of the world, to be a standard bearer in the army of Christ. As within those Roman legions, they would hold their standards high to encourage one another and keep on fighting. That's what you were called to be. And just as they had their citizenship in the, in the Roman Empire, he told them in Philippians 3, but our citizenship is in heaven. It's even more. It's even greater. It's even better. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as a good soldier, what are your marching orders? Do you know what they are? Have you spent time seeking your commander to find out what they are? Take the land came out of Deuteronomy 1. In the beginning of that chapter, the Lord is laying out the scope of the operation, the size of the land. You'll go from this place to this place and from this river to that river and this mountain to that mountain. And he's telling them in 1.8, See, I have set the land before you. Go and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. The Lord had been giving an order for generations. You're going to take the land. It's going to be yours. Go and do it. See, when God gives us a vision, it is our responsibility to chase after it with everything that we have. To start going after it and saying, God, what's next? God, what's next? God, what's next? And go, go, go. And when I think about that and what that looks like and where I have seen that, I'm reminded of daring faith. And when we look back at daring faith, it, it often amazes me to realize that most of us don't remember that. Because God hadn't brought us to that season. You weren't here yet. And we want to talk about the stories and what God has done. See, we were a church at Seckman High School for more than 10 years, loading in and loading out. And we had grown to more than 400 on average, and God kept giving orders. And we had two churches planted from us, and those are strong, healthy, vibrant churches. And God kept giving orders, and God kept giving orders. Here's how we advance the gospel. And the question came, okay, Lord, we're down to about 300. What do we do next? What's the next step? How do we advance the gospel? And the elders and the leadership team, they said, well, we think it's time to find a permanent home. Wait a minute, time out. We're going the wrong direction for that. Shouldn't we be growing to get there? Because during this season right now, we planted two churches. That's great. But really, now? Well, it looked like the king had given an order. And I'll never forget that fall when we started teaching on daring faith. There was some concern for our pastor Ed because he started losing weight and a lot of weight. Uh, I think 20 to 30 pounds inside a month. And he was starting to look sick. He's a guy with a lot of energy and you would see him sitting while he was preaching. It's like, that's, that's not normal, Ed. Well, and what he shared with his wife and what he shared with his son and then eventually with the leadership team and then eventually with the whole congregation. As we were entering Daring Faith, Ed had tried a couple of times to do something big and bold in a cool video. He thought he'd go, you know, skydiving, maybe go hang gliding. And God kept, for some reason or another, interrupting those plans, and that never came to fruition. And he told him, I have a bigger plan for you. I'm calling you away to a 40-day fast, water only. And he committed to it. And he did it. He did it under a doctor's care, and that, that's, that's what we were seeing the effects of. As he sought the Lord, Lord, what are your orders and God met him. God shared with him, there are three things Encounter Church needs to do. You need to pay off about $300,000 worth of debt. You need to find a permanent home and you need to secure property for the future. All at the same time. And at this point, we were down to 250 or so. That's crazy. How do we get there? And Ed brought it before the leadership team and said, this is what God is telling me. And the leadership team prayed and sought the Lord and said, yes, we agree. That is what God is calling us to do. We had never met this building, seen this place. We didn't know it was coming. But we began chasing after it. This is, this is the idea of Rhema and Logos that we taught on last year. See, Logos is the Bible. It is the written word of God. You could look at it as the standing orders of your army. 
it is the idea of, you know, I'm not sure if I should tell the gospel to that person. Absolutely you should. The Bible calls us to go and make disciples. You don't have to question it. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to give. We're supposed to be cheerful givers. Absolutely. I don't know if I'm supposed to serve. Absolutely. All things to all men. There are the clear standing orders of the Lord. And then there's the idea of rhema, which is the specific revelation God has given to you for where you're supposed to advance the gospel, where you're supposed to be serving in his kingdom. And when I first ran into this idea, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's crazy talk. I grew up Catholic. We don't do that. The churches that I came to maturity in the faith, well, we didn't really talk that way. You know, that idea is, is for those crazy people on the TV that the Lord God is going to give me a red Corvette, and man, I get a red Corvette. Amen. I got to tell you, that's not biblical at all. The Lord God of the universe absolutely has a specific plan in mind for you. We see it all throughout Scripture. We see it in 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul encourages us, do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecy, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. If we're not supposed to despise prophecy, that means we're supposed to love it. We're supposed to look for it. We're supposed to desire it. But that word prophecy has a lot of baggage. What does it mean? And I found this great uh, definition of it through, through Desiring God and John Piper. And it says, prophecy is a regulated message or report in human words usually made to the gathered believers based on a spontaneous personal revelation from the Holy Spirit. It's a whole lot of words. It's the idea that God has spoken to you. God has shown you something that is consistent with his word. It is consistent with our calling in the Lord that he wants you to do. The purpose of it is edification, building up one another in truth, encouragement, looking forward to what's to come consolation when we're down and depressed and full of grief to know that our victory is assured conviction we are sinful people and we have to deal with our sin and guidance god what is the next step but it is not necessarily free from a mixture of human error sometimes we hear wrong and thus needs assessment on the basis of apostolic or biblical teaching and mature spiritual wisdom that's the idea of going one to another and sharing it with each other and hearing from the Lord. We're going to keep getting into that more and more. We see visions throughout the Bible. We think of the book of Daniel, Daniel 7, Daniel 11, where God gives him these great visions of the future, visions of dreams, and what he's supposed to do. We see it in the book of Acts in 9 and 16 and 18, where visions are given to Paul. And we think, well, yeah, they're special guys. I mean, those are people that God had raised up. That makes sense that they get visions. The Bible has more of that in store for us. In Jeremiah 29, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. God has a plan for you. And I've heard people say before, well, but you realize he's really specifically talking to the Israelites in captivity. That cannot be applied to us. Okay, okay, well, let's see if the scripture says more. Proverbs 29, where there is no prophetic vision, where no one is seeking the Lord and bringing it to his people, the people cast off restraint. They go crazy. They sin. But blessed is he who keeps the law. We should be hearing from the Lord. In Acts 10, Paul, or the Lord gives a vision both to Peter and to Cornelius. Who's Cornelius? He was a Roman legionnaire. If he hadn't had this moment, you never would have heard from him. You wouldn't know who he was in history. But he was a man who was a faithful man that when God came calling and gave him an order, he obeyed. And we see in, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul tells us about a man who had a vision of heaven. He doesn't even tell us the man's name. The implication here is the, the name wouldn't matter. You wouldn't know who he was. God gives vision to everyday people just like you. He wants you to know the plans that he has to prosper you and the plans that he has to raise you up and forward his gospel. This is what the Bible talks about in Acts 2 and Joel 2. When 
Peter says, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit, the Holy Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. This is why we don't need Old Testament prophets anymore. They were a specific class of people that heard from the Lord, but you now have the Holy Spirit living in guiding you in your life, in your heart, so you don't have to be dependent upon other people. You can touch directly to the Lord your God and hear from him. Amen? I tell you what, he keeps going. Paul explains this, because you would think something this big, it's got to have some scriptural support. In 1 Corinthians 2, we're going to camp out here for a while, really lays out the idea of vision and what it looks like, the idea of prophecy. Paul says, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Whenever you start a new chapter, it's always a good idea to look what came before. First Corinthians, he builds up the wisdom of God. He com- contrasted to the wisdom of man. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He didn't come in the wisdom of the world. Paul didn't. He came to just preach the word of God. So that it is written, let no one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, if you hear people up here on this stage lifting themselves up, look at what Encounter Church has done, run away. Don't wait till the end of service, just leave. It is for God's glory and God's glory alone that we are here and we do what we do to see all people raised to life in Christ. And if you hear anything else, you run. I got to tell you, he keeps going back in 1 Corinthians 2. He says in verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. Paul was not a strong person at this point. My speech, my message were not implausible words of wisdom. It doesn't make sense to the world. But in demonstration of the Spirit and power, and this is so huge, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. See, vision and prophecy, following the orders of God, is all about growing your faith. It's about you being dependent upon the Lord and Him alone, and not trying to figure out the order, not trying to find the solution or what to do next. It's hearing from God and taking that next step that He delivers. He goes on, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are due to pass away. Notice who he says he gives it to, the mature, to those who are complete in Christ. Because that's where people can get off the track that we'll talk, see some more later on. When you're a new believer, it's hard to discern the word of God. That's why you you will stick to the main and plain. You'll hear him talk about the main and plain of scripture, going and making disciples, reading your Bible, going to church. It keeps going in seven. We impart this, this, impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. Secret and hidden? When I think of secret and hidden, I think of my favorite kind of TV shows, which are the whodunit cop shows. I want to figure it out before they tell me. That is not the secret and hidden of God. That is not what a mystery in the Bible is. A mystery in the Bible is something that can only be revealed and understood through the providence of the Holy Spirit. You cannot figure it out on your own. Only God can show it to you. And so he, we give to the mature the secret and hidden wisdom of God. And notice what he says there at the end of that. For our glory. Paul's a smart guy. And immediately in the next verse, he says, None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He, right behind, talking about our glory, talks about the Lord of glory. You think it's a mistake? Our glory comes from the Lord. Our glory comes because we are standing in him. We are lifting him high so that we draw all men unto him. And it is not for our sakes. It is for God's sake that we do things and we get the overflowing of his richness, of his goodness, of his glory, that they're connected. Verse nine, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear is heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 
I've heard this verse a lot. Every time I hear it, somebody's talking about heaven. They're not talking about heaven at all here. They're talking about the wisdom of God, the vision, the prophetic vision that God gives to you to move forward in your life right now. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. That's the idea of, you know, if I don't see it, if I can't know it, it's not right. We are the show me state, you show me first and then I'll think about it. No heart has imagined. That's the idea of, I can figure it out. If I can understand it, then I'll do it. No, 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 beloved. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart has imagined what God has for you in store on this planet as you are a good soldier of Christ advancing his gospel. It is unbelievable what he's waiting to do. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. You have the Holy Spirit living in you, directing you and guiding your path if you learn to listen. At the end in verse 15 of this section, he says, the spiritual person judges all things, but he himself is to be judged by no one. That goes back to that idea of the wisdom of this world. That has it, has it, are, are you getting how important he sees this? What we do is foolishness to the world. I'll tell you, I experience this on a regular basis. I'm the gentleman that, that deals with the banks and, and making sure that our financings are moving forward. And what I hear all the time from these banks is, what are you doing? How do you do that? That's not right. We got to be missing something. What they're missing and that they don't see and they don't get is the power and anointing of the Lord Jesus. And it just blows their minds. It's something that can be going on here. How does that work? And they want to find the man-made reason. They want their eye to see. They want their ear to hear. They want the heart to imagine. And it doesn't work that way. It makes no sense. As we were walking through this and we got to the point where the loan fell through, that we kept going. That we had 160 people seeking a loan for almost $3 million. That doesn't happen. That's foolishness and should never happen. And it wouldn't except through the power and the glory of the Holy Spirit. So I hope you're seeing vision should be a part of your life. But it's hard. It doesn't make sense. How does it work? What is it actually going to look like when I do it? And Paul gives us some more instruction. In 1 Corinthians 3, he shows us what it looks like when it goes wrong. He says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Remember that mature, complete idea? But as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready for it, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? When prophecy and vision is misunderstood, when it's not received and checked against the word of God, it will cause strife. It will cause division. It will cause people to go, no, 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 this part is mine. No, 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 this part is mine. I need the glory for this because that was my idea. And that is not the way God works. We are supposed to seek him first. We are supposed to take what we hear from him to other people and we will see God glorified through it. And so we get into 1 Corinthians 14 and he, he lays out a little bit of how this should look. In 1 Corinthians 14 26, what then brothers when you come together each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Remember we talked about before, prophecy is used to edify, to build up, to teach believers what they need to know about the Lord Jesus to advance his gospel. It should glorify others and God, never the self. If what you think you're hearing from God should glorify you, you're doing it wrong. If any speak in a tongue, let there only be two or three at most, and each in turn and let someone interpret. All right, tongues. Yeah, we're not going there this morning. All right, that, that's like a whole sermon series, and, 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 and know that I'll talk to you about it if you want. I just don't have time today. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. That is the idea of consensus. God is not going to tell me one thing and lay it upon my heart. And I go and share it with you and you go, no, that's not what I'm hearing from God at all. One of us, maybe both of us is wrong. 
God will lay upon our hearts and confirm it with his scripture and with the brothers and sisters in Christ, his vision. Verse 30, if a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. If Ed would have had that vision from the Lord and brought it to the elders, and all the elders went, no, no, I don't think that's right. We wouldn't be here today. It wouldn't have happened. It was through all of us diligently seeking the Lord and hearing from him and being able to confirm one to another, yes, that is the vision God has for us. Yes, that is the plan that he has to prosper us. That's where we're going. And we are encouraged to do this. In 1 John 4, 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. When somebody comes and said, hey, I've heard a word from God, you don't just go, okay, let's do it. I think of Ed and how he took it to the elders and we prayed together and we fasted together. And because we were one of cord, we knew what the Lord had and it brought us here. And I think of another church that I know in another state where, where the pastor wanted to do something similar. There was a big building project that he wanted to do and the elders were like, no, no, I, I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's right. And the pastor of his own accord then went and signed up the church for a $6 million loan. And that church is just imploding right now because what they're doing was not of God. They did not have it grounded in scripture. They did not have the consensus of the prophets and the elders in their congregation. This man just chased after the glory that he thought was before him. I think of when we take, no matter what it is, even the small things to one another. I, I have had the great privilege of being able to pray for my family for years and years and years. I've been able to baptize my dad. I've been able to baptize my mom. I've been able to baptize my sister. And I got to tell you, when my sister accepted Christ, I went up to Kevin, her husband, my brother-in-law, and I was just so happy. And I'm hugging him and I'm saying, one more, one more. I got a brother. I need one more. And he, he said to me, no, a lot more. And he started naming off all the people that he wanted to see saved because God expand, expands our vision as we bring it to one another and we keep seeking him. And we go through those times where we hear from the Lord and it just doesn't seem to be working. We take this big step, this daring faith step, and it doesn't seem to come to fruition. And one of the things that I've learned through this process of giving here is that daring faith equals growing faith. It goes back to that idea of 1 Corinthians 2, that it is to grow our faith with what we're doing. And again, the Bible, the standing orders of God has this in it. It brings up the idea in Habakkuk 2, 3. The Lord answered me. Why was it not happening, Lord, is my question. And he answered, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who hears it. It shouldn't be flowery words. It shouldn't be this great grandiose plan that not everybody can understand. It is the clear direction of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Share it with people so that they can run after it. So they can run after God to advance his gospel. Or still uh, run who reads it. Still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. The Lord God, his timing is perfect. And when we look in the future at these people, that they were waiting years, they were waiting generations for the vision that God had given them to come to pass. And yet we often want it. We want it right now. I, I was speaking with Brother John about his, his vision and what he was called to do when we were coming here. And one of the things he was talking about is, you know, so often we think, God, I want this, and so I expect it now. Not only do I expect it now, but you're the God who knows our thoughts before we have it. So really, I'm praying for it now, but I think I should already have it. Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? I want it right now, God. Give it to me. That's not how God works. It is to grow our faith. I think of Tyler Perstrobe. Why did it take 30 days and longer for him to be healed? I don't know. But it was God's perfect timing. I, I think of the times that God has led me to failure. I, I think of when the, the job opening at Fox High School Band had come, and I thought, God, am I supposed to be the high school band director? And he tells me, apply for it. I assume if I'm supposed to apply for it, I'm supposed to get it. And I didn't get it. What? I don't understand what happened. 
And as the years went by, I came to realize God was letting me work those desires out in my life. So when he called me here to step out of teaching, I'm not looking backwards. I'm not looking and going, well, what if I had done that? Man, I could have been really good at that. He worked all those things out so that I was prepared to walk in the path and the vision that he had set for me right now. And God is going to do the same thing in your life if you'll let him. When we came here, when we were working for it and that loan fell through, it was like a punch in the gut. We had a bank that committed to loan us the money. And then we come to find out things were slowing down. We couldn't figure out why. And eventually the story came to us that on their loan committee, the group that makes the decisions, two members had died. The president of the bank that strongly supported us and the lady that was known as the philanthropic heart of the bank. She worked with the nonprofits. They both passed away while we were waiting to close our loan. And the new leadership, they said, we don't want this church loan. That doesn't make any sense. They were looking at it with the wisdom of the world. And so then they started to hand it off to other banks. And the other banks would look at it and go, why, why do we want this if you don't want it? And they wouldn't even look at it. And when we found out that, that we weren't going to get the loan, we started going to these other banks. And they said, oh, no, I've already looked at this and I passed at it. I don't want that. And we couldn't find the way through Papa John shared with me that when we hit a barrier, we often think, how do we get over? How do we get through? How do we go around? Or do we find another route? What are we supposed to do? And it's when we get to that point where we don't know what to do that our faith has grown, that we look to the Lord, that we pray, that we ask, that we trust, that we stay true to the marching that God has told us. And we keep seeking his vision. God, what do I do right now? And as Papa John asked him that question, he told him, remember Jericho. What did they do at Jericho? And so Papa John said, I'll do it, Lord. And for seven days, every morning he came and he marched around this building. And he prayed, Lord God, what do you want from us? Lord God, is this ours? We believe it is. We believe you gave it to us. But Lord, we keep running into a wall and it hurts. What do we do now? And he finished his seven days, and he knew he was done. He had done what God had called him to do, and the rest was all up to God. See, one of the things that we learned through this, and I hope you've learned this. If not, you will. That patience and faith work hand in hand. That it is through resting on God and looking for his vision and looking for what he has to do, not trying to do it through your own eyes, your own hands, your own heart, that he grows your faith. And one of the things that we then will come to realize is that sometimes that struggle, that struggle is the reward because he grows you in it. He takes your, flat, your, your faith that started like a mustard seed and just keeps moving it and molding it and shaping it so that your faith is big enough for the next thing that he has planned for you. I look at us here today, and we went from a church of about 160 that we're, we're over 400 again, more than 300 on average. We have seen more people saved in the last two years than we saw in the previous five, and that is only because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wanted us to grow. God wanted us to learn, and we boast in no one but him. And I think of Hebrews 11. And the, this, what's referred to as the hall of fame of faith. And these, these men and these women that are here, and it talks about that by faith, Abel made a better sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was taken up. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Sarah conceived. By faith, Isaac gave blessings. By faith, Jacob spoke of a homecoming. And by faith, Moses left Egypt. And I, it makes me think, what is special about our pastor? He's a great piano player. There are better ones. He is a great father. He has raised up his children to walk in the Lord. There are better fathers. But when I look at that man, I see a man of such great faith that when he runs into a wall, he doesn't let the wall knock him down and make him stop. And then it makes him go, God, what's next? God, where do I go from here? And he will chase after the Lord his God no matter what comes. And you can follow that man because he's following God. Amen. It keeps going in Hebrews 11 and talking about more things. And what more shall I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, 
of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Because of their faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, the world was not worthy of them as they wandered about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves. And time would fail me to tell you of more stories of the Hazes, of the Etlings, the Mans, the Pippins, the Womacks, the Lefflers, the MacArthurs, the Buckinghams, the Dans, the Davises, of reunions and salvations and restorations and hardships and work difficulties and depression and loss and the things that we have overcome for the great glory of our Lord because of the power that he has placed within you both to do and to will for his good pleasure. God has a vision for you. Are you seeking it? Are you chasing after it? Are you listening for it? He gives us this great memory, this great memorial. And in Hebrews 12, he tells us, therefore, because of all of those things we talked about, lift your drooping heads, strengthen your weak knees, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. It is hard. You will suffer defeat when you're fighting because you're human. But when you remember these great things that we have seen in the Bible, when you remember the things that God has done in your life, and when in the life of your church, it builds up your faith so that you can be made whole again and keep advancing the gospel against the darkness. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, and no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble that it may be defiled. He makes a turn here, which seems kind of weird, and he says that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. God will make his vision plain to you like he did with Esau. But what did Esau do? He let the momentary, temporary hunger, the momentary, temporary need take him off of the path that was before him. God did great things with it. But Esau wanted that opportunity back, and he couldn't get it. It had passed. That is one of the great fears of my life. Lord, I want to chase after you. I want to follow you. I don't want there to be a moment where I look back and I go, ah, I missed it. I know that restoration is coming. He will restore you if that's your story. If you look back at your life and you go, I missed it. He will restore you. He will lift you up and raise you up, grant you a new vision that you can't imagine, that you couldn't discover on your own as he calls you to be a soldier in his army and advance the gospel of Christ. What are your marching orders? As our band comes forward, this is the most important time right now. Our counselors are gonna head to the back. Our ET members are gonna head out to receive you as you leave. But everyone else, please stay. This is a time where you need to seek the Lord. What are your marching orders? For some of you, you know, you are walking confidently, and it is a time to pray and give him praise and adoration and rejoice in what God has set before you. Some of you need to just start listening, start looking. If you're new to the faith, it's going to start with the simple stuff. He'll be reminding you, read your word, learn about me. Don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. Give, serve, share my word, share the gospel. Some of you, you're more mature in the faith. You need to find that next step. You need to see a counselor and start praying. It might be you don't need to go find a counselor. You need to turn to the person next to you. You need to turn to your spouse. You need to turn to your child. You need to turn to your parent. You need to turn to your friend and just come together with one accord and seek the Lord's vision for your life. What does God have for you to do? You hear from the Lord. You bring it to your e-group. This is what I'm hearing from the Lord. 
pray with me. Help me to know and understand. Am I on the right path? Am I going the right way? The song has a verse in it that says, Church arise, with God we cannot falter, because victory is found in our commander. Your victory is assured. As you seek the Lord, don't be afraid. Failure will come. Your job is to fail forward. And when you mess up, just fall upon the grace of Jesus, and he will restore you and uplift you. Set your feet back on the path and get you to keep working for your good and for his glory. Don't leave today without seeking the Lord's vision for your life. Whether that's with a counselor, whether it's a person sitting next to you, whether it's with a pastor or friend, don't leave today without hearing from God.